Okay, let's get into it. Today we are talking about uh, loving like Jesus, which is what we've been doing for the last several, several weeks, but specifically today we're going to be talking about peaceful love. What does it look like to have peace in your life? What, what does it look like to attain or keep peace in your life? You know, I can tell you that uh, if you just look around the world, look around our community, it's easy to see how people are trying to achieve peace in their life. We, we try to get peace in a lot of different ways, don't we? We, we try to get it maybe uh, by doing certain exercises. We try to get peace maybe by going up on a mountain or being in wilderness. Maybe we try and get peace by hunting more. Maybe we try and get peace by try, just trying to get to retirement. And then in retirement, we're going to have peace. Or maybe it's more like getting that job promotion or just getting a pay raise. Some of us also maybe try to find peace at the bottom of a bottle or by taking some other kind of substance, or by pursuing relationships uh, with other individuals. There are lots of ways that I think culture tells us that this is how you find peace. This is how you get peace in your life. But if you've lived it all, and you've tried any of these at all, it, it's easy for us to look at this and go, this is a flawed system. That you're not going to find peace at the bottom of a bottle. You're not going to find lasting peace out in wilderness or in a hunting uh, blind or, or getting more money. None of this is going to give you lasting peace. Today we want to talk about peace a little bit, and we're going to look at this, uh, this time where Jesus had an encounter with a woman who was not at peace. And so if you have your Bible, if you'll turn to, uh, to Luke chapter 7, we're going to read this starting in verse 36. Read this with me, please. Then one of the Pharisees invited him, meaning Jesus, to eat with him. He entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And a woman in the town who was a sinner found out that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house. She brought an alabaster jar of fragrant oil and stood behind him at his feet weeping and began to wash his feet with her tears. She wiped his feet with her hair, uh, the hair of her head, kissing them and, and anointing them with the fragrant oil. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, This man, if he were a prophet, would, he, would know who and what kind of woman this is, who is touching him. She is a sinner. Jesus replied to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he said, say it. A creditor had two debtors. One owed him 500 denari denarii and the other 50 since they could not pay it back, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose, the one he forgave more. You've judged correctly, he told him. Turning to the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she with her tears has washed my feet and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss but she hasn't stopped kissing my, my feet since I came in. You didn't anoint my head with olive oil, but she has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. That's why she, loves, she loved much. But the one who is forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Those who were at the table with him began to say amongst themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, meaning Jesus, said to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. Pray with me, please. Father, I'm thankful for uh, your word. Thank you for um, just this, this short little snippet out of Luke that uh, shows uh, Jesus loving uh, this woman who uh, is clearly broken in her state. And Father, I just pray for us right now as we unpack this together. Uh, Father, I pray your spirit uh, be here. I pray that your spirit work here in us and that you would bring us uh, to a place of growth and conviction uh, and challenge in our life, Father. Um, we look to see you doing a work here. And we look to see you growing us uh, and challenging us and bringing us closer to you. Father, I pray this. In your son Jesus' name, amen. 
And so what we have here is uh, Jesus being invited into the house of a Pharisee for a meal. And so Jesus makes his way into this house, and they start to begin their night, and then off of the street walks in a woman. Now, we don't know a lot about this woman, but uh, as you unpack this and as you read other people who have studied and the, looking at the wording of it, it's a fairly safe bet to say that she was probably a prostitute. I mean, if we look at the wording there, it says, a woman in the town who was a sinner. She was known as a sinner in the town. Her sin that she struggled with was a public sin. And so we can say she's a prostitute, maybe she wasn't. It doesn't necessarily change the fact she was a known sinner who was known to be somebody who had a lot of sin in her life and really shouldn't be around religious people. And so she makes her way into uh, into this place. And what we see here, if, if we do believe that she is a prostitute, as we talk about peace, she's looking for peace in the wrong places. And specifically, she's looking for peace in the bed of strangers. And she's not found that peace. And so she, she hears that Jesus is in town, and she hears that Jesus is in the home eating a meal with this Pharisee, and so she wants to be near Jesus, and so she makes her way into the presence of Jesus, she's weeping. She's broken because of her sin and who she is around. She's clearly without peace here. Now, let's look at Simon the Pharisee here. Simon the Pharisee is kind of on the other end of the spectrum here. The Pharisees were uh, essentially the, the Jewish religious uh, elite. They were very popular in the religious system of the, of the Jews, and they wanted to keep their popularity. And so they did things kind of extravagantly and, and out in public so that people would see what they did, and, and they would be in almost awe of how religious and spiritual these individuals are. And so uh, his work was trying to maintain his status that, it was, that, uh, that was seen by other people. And so uh, we have him who uh, was really trying to find peace in his status, in his religion, in fulfilling what he needed to fulfill. He's trying to find peace in life in, in what he did and in what he believed. And so we have this interesting contrast here between this woman and Simon the Pharisee. And here's, here's what we're going to see today as we talk about peace and as we talk about attaining peace, we're going to start here. Peace is found in being seen and in seeing. Peace is found in being seen and in seeing. Because here's the reality for most of us, and I'm just as much included in this as anybody else. Sometimes we don't see people that are around us. Now, sure, and I know this might get a little confusing, but I hope you, you hear me. We see people, right? Right? We can go out into Walmart, we can drive down the road, and we see the people on the side of the road. We see the, the people that are in Walmart. But do we really see what's going on in their life? Do we really see the hurt that's in their life? Do we really see the pain and the struggle that's in their life? And i got to be honest, a lot of times I see them in the sense that I acknowledge their existence, but I don't necessarily see them. I don't necessarily see who they really are. We're going to unpack that a little bit later on. And so we have Simon the, the Pharisee here that didn't see this woman. He didn't see her. And so Jesus asks, and we get a good picture of this in verse 44, he says, Simon, do you see this woman? Do you see her? I mean, he knew she was there. He acknowledges her existence, but Simon, do you see this woman? Simon wasn't seeing here, and I and I think there's a couple of reasons why Simon wasn't seeing her, and frankly, there's a couple of reasons why we don't see uh, the people around us as well. And the first one is this. We don't see people around us because we don't see Jesus for who he really is. We don't see people around us because we don't see Jesus for who he really is. Look at verse 39. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, this man if he were a, a prophet, would know who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him. She is a sinner. Because here it is. This is, what, this is what Simon the prophet's saying. If this supposed prophet knew who was touching him, he would not allow her to touch him. 
He's making some pretty, some pretty bold assumptions about Jesus right here. He's making assumptions that Jesus does not want to be around sinners. He's making assumptions that Jesus did not come for sinners. He's making assumptions that Jesus wants to be like, like Simon the Pharisee. He's making some bold assumptions here because he's, he's essentially putting Simon and Jesus at the same level and saying, if you were a prophet, if you were kind of like me, you would not want to be in the same place as this sinner. If you were a prophet, he would not want her presence to be around him. Simon was assuming that the God of this prophet that was here was expecting him to eat with people who were good enough. He was making assumptions that this prophet and his God would be just like him, more self-righteous, more religious, who didn't want to be seen with sinners around them. But, but this is a huge misunderstanding, right? This is a misunderstanding about who God is, about who Jesus is, and why Jesus came to this earth, isn't it? Jesus, Jesus came to this earth not, not to kind of separate himself from sinners, but to be in the midst of them. He came to this earth to seek and to save the lost. Here, let me remind you a few verses of why God sent Jesus. Here's a few of them. Luke 19.10. You don't have these uh, on the screen, I don't believe. Luke 19.10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. John 3.16. For God loved the world this way. He gave His one and only Son so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. Romans 5, 8 and 9. But God proves his, love, his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us much more than since we have now been declared righteous by his blood, we will be saved through him from wrath. And 1 Corinthians 9.22, to the weak I became weak in order to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that I may by every possible means save some. See, Simon the Pharisee is making a big, incorrect assumption here that Jesus is going to act like Simon the Pharisee. But Jesus came to be in the midst of sinners, and Jesus came to save sinners. See, Simon did not see Jesus for who he really was and is. Do you see Jesus as the man who was sent to free the slaves, to save and redeem those who were lost and away from him? Do we see Jesus that way truly? And if so, that should impact how we see other people around us. Oftentimes, we don't see the people around us because we don't first see Jesus as he should be seen. The second one is this. We don't see people around us because we don't see people for who they really are. So oftentimes, we don't see people because we don't see people around us for who they really are. Simon didn't really see this woman. I believe he probably acknowledged her existence coming in, and he registered who she was, but did he really see what was going on in her life? Jesus asks, do you see this woman? And if I can just add a little bit of emphasis here, and this is my translation, so take it for what it is worth. I believe Jesus is really trying to say, Simon, do you really see this woman? Do you really see what's going on with her right now? I think many of us would see her. I think many of us would, would acknowledge that she is there. Maybe even we would try to interact with her a little bit, but would we really see what's going on in her life? I struggle with that. I struggle that I would even see that sometimes. But here in this room, in this Pharisee's house, we have Jesus sent by God, we have this Pharisee sitting over here, we have some of his buddies, I assume, are there as well, and we have this woman that came, comes in off the street and she's weeping. She's broken before Jesus, she's crying on his feet and then using her hair to wash the dirt off of his feet, and she's kissing him, and then she takes this oil and she anoints uh, his feet. She is broken here in this room is a broken individual who is desperately trying to find peace in her life. And I don't believe at the end of this encounter, in verse 50, if you look at verse 50 here, when Jesus tells her to go in peace, I don't believe those words were put there by accident. 
I believe this entire encounter is telling the story of a woman who's desperately trying to find peace, and the only place that she can find peace, and the reality is the only place that we can find peace, is at the feet of Jesus when we're broken. I believe this woman was kneeling before Jesus, weeping, cleaning his feet, anointing his feet, because she's not at peace and she desperately desires for it. And we find her interacting with Jesus, and she's struggling with what's going on inside of her. She's struggling with the sin, and it's coming out in the form of tears and cleaning his feet with her hair and anointing his feet with oil and kissing him. Do we really see that in people? When we look around and we interact with people, do we see them for who they really are? Jesus sees this woman who is broken, who's in need of grace and love and acceptance, and Jesus offers her peace. He sees her for who she really is. Because what we can learn from this is a few things. One of them is is this, peace comes when we are loved and when we're loving others. Peace comes to us when we're loved and when we're loving others. Love comes from this sinful woman, and love is given to this sinful woman. Love comes from this sinful woman. She's offering everything she has to Jesus in this moment. In an act of of really true worship of who he is, she's offering all that she has to her in worship and in love. And we, we don't see this righteous Pharisee here doing the same thing. I mean, it was customary at the time for for whenever you were a guest in a house that the, the host would, would offer at least a bowl for you to wash your feet and, and some oil to help kind of clean yourself up a little bit and a greeting in the form of a kiss. This was normal, and we don't see any of that happening here in this time. But we have this sinful woman coming off the street, and she is doing all of this. Simon didn't show any of it. This woman is showing all of it. And Jesus in no way is offended by this. He's not insulted by this woman. He is loved by her, and he loves her. He doesn't reject her worship. Jesus loves her. Even when she comes to to him in her brokenness and in her mess, Jesus loves her probably more because she, she came to him in her brokenness and in her mess. And in the midst of her pain, she loves Jesus by giving all that she had. The alabaster jar of oil, this fragrant oil, as she pours it out on Jesus, there was a lot of rep- there's a lot of money wrapped up in just a little bit of oil right here. Some historians would say that this jar of oil would be worth about $54,000 of today's money. This is a lot of money that she is just pouring out on Jesus' feet here in an act of love and worship. This woman came and brought her mess of a situation before Jesus, and she gives it all to him, and he is loving her in return. Peace comes by us loving and loving, receiving love and loving other people around us. Look again in verse 40, 47, because this begins to take a turn here as well. Verse 47 says, her many sins have been forgiven. That's why she loves so much, but the one who is forgiven little loves little. We have been forgiven so much. Do you believe that? Do you really believe that? Because I think the struggle for us sometime, I think we lose sight of how much we have truly been forgiven. I think we lose sight of how extreme our sin is before a really, truly holy and righteous God. And we lose sight of that and we forget how much we have truly been forgiven. And Scott was right this morning. In a way, our hands are the ones that nailed Christ to the cross. We have been forgiven greatly. Every single one of us deserves to be punished for our sin, and yet Christ went to the cross for us. He loves us in that way, and we find continual forgiveness because of what Christ did for us on the cross And I want to return that great love. I want to return that great love of what Christ did for us on the cross with as much love as I can give in return. I want to return that great love with as much love as I can give in return. See, we can find peace 
when we remember that we are loved by Christ and we love in return, but we can also find peace when we realize that peace comes from being forgiven and forgiving. Peace comes when we realize we have been forgiven and we forgive as well. Forgiving is such a difficult thing. And maybe I'm on, the only one who struggles with forgiving sometimes, but, but forgiving is such a difficult thing. We're really good as, at accepting grace and forgiveness from other people, right? We're really good at receiving it because, you know, we know that, that honestly, we should be forgiven. I mean, if we're getting real with it. But we're really good at receiving it, and yet sometimes, maybe a lot of times, we struggle with actually giving it. We struggle with offering grace and forgiveness to other people. And I think sometimes we can get in this habit of making mental lists in our mind of, of, of all the things that we're okay forgiving people for, but there's this other list over here of things that is just too far. If people talk bad about me, that's just too far. If people stab me in the back, that's too far. If people, whatever it is, that's too far. I'm not going to forgive that, but if you say curse word towards me or, you know, you take my parking spot or whatever, that's fine. I'll forgive that. But there's this whole other set of lists. Or we can do, maybe you do this as well. We forgive people so many times that we've just reached our limit. I've forgiven them three times, five times, 20 times, however many times. I just can't do it anymore. I have to keep forgiving them. I just, it's too much for me to forgive anymore. And we struggle with forgiveness and we, we keep points or we tally it and we just get to a place to where we, we refuse to forgive people anymore. But the reality is, the reality is when it comes to our sin before God and others, it's really easy for us to just to expect that we're going to be forgiven because again, we need to understand and remember how much we have been forgiven. We have to remember how much we have been forgiven, and that should drive us to forgive just as much and more. We have to get a proper understanding of how much we have been forgiven so that we can forgive others as well. And this is the point of the parable that Jesus told Simon here. Let's read this, verse 41. A creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50 Since they could not pay it back, he graciously forgave them both. So, which of them will love him more? And Simon answered, I suppose the one he forgave more. You have judged correctly, Jesus told him. A denarii uh, was was a measurement of of money. 500 denarii was about 20 months worth of wages back then. 50 denarii would have been about two months wages. And so, you know, if you want, you can kind of do the math and translate it translate that in today's standards based on whatever you make. But the point is this. One man was forgiven a lot. The other man was forgiven, I still think, a lot, just maybe not as much. The point is they both have been forgiven, and they both should be forgiving because of that. Because here's the reality. Some of us have been forgiven 500 denarii worth, right? Some of us have been forgiven a lot. Some of us, probably, when we start kind of comparing ourselves, have been forgiven less as much. Maybe we fit into the 50 denarii category of forgiveness. The reality is it doesn't matter. We are still forgiven. And that should drive us and force us and cause us to forgive as well. Think about the cross of Christ and think about our sin And think about grace. It doesn't matter how much or how little we have been forgiven. The common thread here is that you have been forgiven. And what we can offer Christ in return for what he has done for us is nothing in comparison to how much Christ has forgiven us. What we can offer in return to Christ is nothing in compared to how much Christ has forgiven us. And if I can just throw this one little piece in here, the flip side to this as well. Matthew uh, chapter 6, if we read verse 14 and 15, it says, For if you forgive people of their wrongdoing, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive people, your Father will not forgive your wrongdoing. These verses ought to scare us a little bit. 
It should put in a level of at least us looking at ourselves and going, am I forgiving people? Because there seems to be a correlation between how much I forgive and how, how much forgiveness I'm going to receive. This woman praises Jesus because she has been forgiven much. And it should cause us, as we accurately look at how much we have been forgiven, it should cause us to praise Jesus as well. But contrast that with Simon the Pharisee here. He is a man who, like us, is in need of much forgiveness. He's in need of much forgiveness. He's like us. He's self-centered, and he's a sinner. And he could be forgiven much, but he's really pushing against that, we see here. He doesn't think or see that he needs it. And there seems to be a correlation between his ignorance to be forgiven and the amount of forgiveness that he offers this woman. He doesn't think he needs forgiven, and he's not willing to forgive this woman. How can any of us stand at the foot of the cross and see all Christ has done for us and not offer to do the same thing for others? How can any of us stand at the foot of the cross and see and understand how much Christ has forgiven us, what he did for us on that cross, and not offer forgiveness to other people? Some of us, we don't have peace in our lives because we're unwilling to forgive. Some of us, we don't have peace in our lives because we are carrying around this anxiety, this burden, this anger, this bitterness towards other human beings. And we're carrying this around. And as long as you carry that around, you will not be able to achieve and have peace in your life. You have to release it. You have to lay it before Christ and you have to go, I give this up, I forgive. Why? Because I have been forgiven of so much more. We need to forgive. And peace can be found when we have a, an accurate understanding of how much we have been forgiven. And peace can be found when we begin to offer forgiveness ourselves. We need to truly embrace forgiveness from Christ and give that same grace to others around us. And only then we will find peace in our lives. If we want to love like Jesus, if we want to be people that are known for loving the world around us like Jesus, we need to offer forgiveness. We need to offer love. And we need to give and receive peace as much as possible. Pray with me. Father, it's difficult, um, it's difficult to look at, at times like this because for many of us, it hits home of who we truly are in our heart. Father, as we move on um, from this today, I pray that you would not let this leave our hearts and our minds. That so many of us are living every day without peace uh, because we are carrying around the weight and the burden of, of bitterness and anger and resentment towards uh, other human beings that are, that are made in your image, that are your children and we are harboring this anger and resentment towards them. Father, I pray for us as, uh, as we seek peace in our lives that uh, we would look to where our heart is first. Are we forgiving others? Are we loving others the way that you did and do? Father, only then, as we work through these things, can we truly love the world around us like you did. Father, give us the strength and the courage to to stand up and to say, I'm no longer going to harbor this. I'm no longer going to be unloving and unforgiving. And I'm going to uh, step out in courage and strength and offer this because we all have been forgiven so much. Give us the strength and the courage to do this, Father, we pray in your son Jesus' name. Amen.